Alleluia. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Happy Easter. So wonderful we can join together, to, whether it's online or in person, for a wonderful opportunity to celebrate our risen Lord and Savior. What a privilege it is to be able to hear the good news, hear it together, but then also to share it with others out into the world. There's an Easter breakfast in Fellowship Hall, if you've made reservations for that. Christine Schmoker and crew does an amazing and marvelous job, and so thanks to Christine for providing that opportunity uh, for, for some fellowship uh, between services. Um, also, you, you may see in the announcements an announcement about Easter candy. If you are getting bundles and bundles and you have extra, we're going to be able to send some uh, care packages to our college students for finals week. So if you have a little extra and you're willing to share it with the, with the church, we can then share it with, with our college students as they prepare for finals uh, in another month or so. Women Divine coming up for their fellowship event on Tuesday. Bible studies are resuming. And then this Wednesday, there will be a memorial service for our dear Debbie Jensen. Um, Debbie served as pastor here, great friend of all. Our sympathies to uh, husband Craig and son Paul will be gathering in the sanctuary for a service at uh, 11 o'clock on Wednesday. More information in the bulletin, streaming online, available on the website. But we gather now with the good news that though there is death and grief in this world, we are not people who are left weeping at the grave. We are people of hope, people of belief, people that Jesus calls to share, to sing, and to rejoice. Let us begin our time of worship together.
Would you please join me in our call to worship in your bulletin and on the screen? I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will our help come? Our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. God will not let our feet be moved. The God who keeps us will not slumber. The one who keeps watch will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is our keeper. The Lord is our shade at our right hand. The sun shall not strike us by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep us from all evil. The Lord will keep our life. The Lord will keep our going out and our coming in from this time on and forevermore. I invite you to rise. Please be seated. My friends, we are reminded this day of the lengths by which Jesus would go to show us how much we are loved. The cross is the symbol of Christ's sacrifice, and the empty tomb is the symbol of Christ's triumph. So with great joy and sure hope, we are able to confess before our great God and King that we are unable to save ourselves and give thanks for the love of Jesus. So let us pray this honest prayer of confession printed in your bulletin and on the screen. We pray together saying, generous in love, God give grace. Huge in mercy, wipe out our bad record. Scrub away our guilt, soak out our sin in your laundry. We know how bad we've been, our sins are staring us down. You have all the facts before you. Whatever you decide about us is fair. 
We've been out of step with you for a long time. What you are after is truth from the inside out. And to our lives then, conceive a new true life within us. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy upon us. Amen. Hear the good news. The stone has been rolled away, and when we peer into the tomb, we can see that it is empty. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven, and you are redeemed. Thanks be to God for this good news. And as forgiven people, we are called to live in a way that brings honor and glory to God each day. How then are we called to live? Hear these words from Paul's letter to the Colossians. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Doing this brings honor and glory to God our Father. And I'd like to invite the younger children forward for the gospel for children. Come on down. How good it is to see you. Glad to have you in church on this special Easter Sunday. Love having you together in church with me. And so we have friends here in church. Everybody's looking so nice, pretty, handsome. And yes, we have a special guest. You may want to come close so you can look over this way because I have, come on, everybody can come on down. Absolutely, we got space for everybody. You can sit right there if you'd like. That's wonderful, glad you're here. What a pretty dress. So nice to have everybody here. One of the people that's here isn't usually here for the Gospel for Children, and it is my friend, Mrs. Savage. Can you say, hi, Mrs. Savage? And can you tell what Mrs. Savage has with her? A chicken, a chicken. Is that your pet? It's somebody that lives with you, though. There you go. Yeah, a nice little hug there for for Mrs. Savage and for our chicken. Do you have pets? Do you have animals that live with you? Uh huh. Two dogs. So, and you probably pet your dog or you pet your cat. You feed them. I bet you feed your chicken, don't don't you? You feed your. Does your chicken have a name? Daisy. Daisy the chicken. Hello, Daisy. So. So Daisy the chicken, you, you kind of can pet Daisy, but not like a dog so much. But does Daisy give you anything? What? Do you think that's true? A chicken lays eggs. Do you get eggs from, from Daisy? We do, every day. Every day. And I brought some, some eggs just so you can see. Because eggs remind me of, of Easter. Did anybody get Easter eggs? Yeah. Here, here's some, some eggs, some special eggs. Yeah, because chickens lay all sorts of different color eggs. They do. Different color eggs. So there's like a green egg and a blue egg. These aren't dyed. These are just regular chicken eggs. How about that? And so you, you've had chicken, chicken eggs. Do you like to eat eggs? How do you like your eggs? Do you like eat them raw? No. No? But you can, you can crack an egg. And you have a nice little chicken egg. And what would I do with this? Cook it. Cook it. Would you like it scrambled? Would you like it fried? What do you like? Hard-boiled eggs. 
Yeah, what do you like? Yes, yeah, soft boiled eggs, hard boiled eggs, poached eggs, scrambled eggs, fried eggs. Daisy gives us lots of good things to eat. Yeah, I'm not going to eat this egg until I cook it. How about that? <laughs> you know, some people might just eat it like that, but I'm going to. I'm not going to eat the raw egg. Like that. You want to touch it? Ooh, there you go. How about that? Thank you, Daisy, for bringing us eggs. So we have eggs that we can eat, but we also, because you said something about there's lots of eggs at Easter, I brought something that's an Easter egg. You know why this is an Easter egg? Yeah, because it's white. It's white, yeah. Okay, backyard, you can Easter egg hunt with the Easter bunnies. That's a good answer, great answer. One of the reasons that this is another reason this is a good Easter egg is... There's nothing in it. What? <laughs> it's an empty egg. It's an empty egg. Oh, empty, that reminds me of a word in the Easter story. An empty what? An empty tomb. That's why this is an Easter egg, because it's empty. There was no yolk inside this one. Nope, Daisy, sorry. This is an Easter egg. When, wait. Oh, it's real. But how? Ah, how about that? But how? It's an Easter egg reminding us that the tomb was empty where Jesus used to be, but now he's alive. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. Easter is here. Alleluia. Thanks for chickens. Thanks for eggs. Thanks for friends. Thanks for Jesus. And thanks for empty tombs. Empty eggs remind us of that. Thanks be to God. Thanks for being with us. Let's pray together. I'm going to say some words, and you can say them with me, okay? Dear God... Thank you. Thank you for Daisy the chicken. And for Mrs. Savage. Thank you for food to eat. For friends. And for the empty tomb. The empty egg. And Jesus. And life. And happiness. And goodness. And joy. Thank you, God. Amen. And thank you. If you want to say hello to, to Daisy, you can come over and say hello as the congregation greets one another in the name of Christ. The tomb is empty so that our lives might be full, full of life, full of joy. And so even in the midst of lots of emptiness, empty wallets, people empty of faith, empty of joy, empty of hope. And that's why we present our offerings.
so that we who have the Easter joy are able then to more and more share it with those in need. Your gifts go directly to help agencies and people who are engaged in mission, supporting people in need and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. So as our choir sings, I would invite the ushers to come forward and for us to share together in a time of offering of our time, our talent, and our treasure. May God bless us and bless these offerings to God's use so that those who are benefited may know the good news of Jesus Christ. I invite you to remain standing as we confess what we believe as Christians through our affirmation of faith. We say together, Jesus Christ is the hope of God's world. In his death, the justice of God is established. Forgiveness of sins is proclaimed. On the day of the resurrection, the tomb was empty. His disciples saw him. Death was defeated. New life has come. God's purpose for the world was sealed. Come, Lord Jesus, we are open to you, Spirit. We await your full presence. Our world needs rest in you alone. Amen. Please be seated.
My friends, Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. risen That's more like it. (laughs) It is a blessing and a great joy to share with you the good news this morning. As we prepare our hearts and our minds to hear the good news, would you please pray with me? God of resurrection, speak your word of hope to us this morning. Empower us to live in the light of the life you gift to us. And may we be changed in hearing your good news. In the name of the risen Lord, we pray. Amen. Hear these words from Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, the first eight verses. Listen now for the word of God. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go, tell the disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for it. My friends, I invite you to rise and respond to the good news through singing, Thine is the Glory.
Please be seated. Now, if you open your Bible and you look at this final chapter of Mark's Gospel, you'll notice that there is seemingly more to the ending. Some translations of Scripture follow these verses with descriptions like the shorter ending of Mark and the longer ending. Some just call them the alternate endings. One that I had seen called them the disputed endings. And the reason these are all there is because, well, we don't actually know what the true ending of Mark's Gospel is. We do know that the earliest transcripts take us up to verse 8, but as the gospel was circulated, these other endings began to take hold and become popular. About a hundred years after the gospel was originally written, these different endings that we have here took its final form. Though the question that always comes up is why does the gospel need any alternate endings at all? What's wrong with verse 8? of the raw, unplugged, acoustic ending, if you will. The way the gospel was meant to be heard, right? I guess some of our faith ancestors heard this ending specifically about the women fleeing the tomb with terror and amazement, being seized with fear, and thought, we can do better. But the ending we have here this Easter morning is the most original. The ending we have for us today is that after the women were greeted by this angelic figure in the empty tomb and instructed to go to the disciples, they flee with amazement, yes, but also with terror and fear. Endings are hard. Figuring out a good ending, it's one of the most difficult things in storytelling. A good ending is supposed to capture the entire essence of a message without compromising the development of the narrative arc while also resolving necessary conflicts and leaving the audience with an intentional emotion that lingers in the hearts and minds. We love a good ending, but an ending that doesn't fit can ruin the entire story. You could have solid gold throughout the whole thing, but if the ending doesn't land, all people will talk about is how that last act left a bad taste in their mouths or worse, made the whole story feel like a waste of time. Good endings are so important. Imagine if Frodo and Sam didn't make it to Mordor, or if Voldemort defeated Harry Potter. Imagine if Ebenezer Scrooge woke up on Christmas morning, it was still greedy. Imagine if the prince never found Cinderella. A good ending brings it all together. But a great ending brings it all together unexpectedly. Now imagine you have never heard the gospel story before. If this was all new to you, then chapter 15 is actually a decent ending. It wraps up the conflict, it doesn't sacrifice the narrative development, and it sure does leave emotions lingering in our hearts and our minds. In fact, I would say that the women on that first Easter Sunday thought that they had experienced the end of the story. The last verses of chapter 15 of Mark say that Joseph of Arimathea had laid Jesus in the tomb and rolled the stone in front, and the two Marys saw where he was laid. All that's missing are the words, the end, right? In their minds, there's no way for the story to continue. They saw Jesus in the tomb dead. So when they approached the tomb, They were expecting death. And the fact is, when we write our own stories, the endings are all the same. Death and sealed tombs. When we are the authors of our own stories, death has the final word. In seminary, they teach us that each gospel writer has his own perspective that the way they tell the story of Jesus is not simply about the facts of his life, but also about exposing certain realities about the human condition. For Mark, it is important for the reader of the gospel to know that we are unable to solve all of the problems of the world by ourselves, that we need a savior because we will always come up short. And Jesus puts this on full blast 
the problems of society right in front of our face in Mark's gospel story, the poverty, the violence, the inequality, the injustice, every time Jesus in Mark's gospel story points out that these things will still be problems as long as you people are writing the story. As long as we are writing the story, there's no hope for a good ending. But when God is writing the story, death is not the final word. Mark teaches us in his gospel that we need God to be the author of the story. When God writes the story, the ending we come to expect gets turned on its head. You know, I heard a story about a fellow pastor who took a call at the, to be the senior pastor at the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City. He began his ministry in the summer of 2008. By the fall of that year, the Great Recession and the housing market crisis was in full swing. What was supposed to be a honeymoon period of getting to know the congregation, visiting people, learning the ministries, turned into one frantic committee meeting after another to discuss the financial issues facing the church and the people in it. And at the end of every meeting, once the council got to a place where they thought that they had solved their problems, they would end and say, we've got it, as long as another shoe doesn't drop. But many of you remember those days. More shoes did drop. And there were more meetings. And they all ended the same way. As long as another shoe doesn't drop, as long as another shoe doesn't drop. Finally, after about the 10th or 11th meeting, the pastor went into his office and he prayed to God saying, please God, no more shoes. <laughs> Just then his phone rang. And it was a volunteer at the homeless shelter that the church ran out of its basement. Said, Pastor, I think you better get down here pretty quick. So he ran downstairs and he was met with two uniformed NYPD officers who said, Pastor, we've just raided an illegal sweatshop in the Bronx. They were making counterfeit Nike sneakers. We've got about 500 pairs of shoes if you like them. <laughs> When God writes the story, the ending we come to expect gets turned on its head. God's story reminds us that not every problem can be addressed in a conference room, that sometimes we need to get out into the world and see where God's story takes us. See, when we are writing the story, we will always ask for no more shoes to drop, even when there are people in our midst who need pairs of shoes. When we write the story, we do everything we can to avoid the pain, to avoid the hurt, to avoid a broken heart. But God's story is about letting hearts be broken so that there's more room within them, more room for care, more room for compassion, more room for love. God knows that hearts only break for the things that we care the deepest about, which is why God's heart broke on the cross on Good Friday. When we write the story, we write out the heartbreak. When God writes the story, heartbreak is a necessary part of life, which is terrifying. And yet, it's the story of resurrection. Here's the truth. The women went to the tomb expecting to find Jesus dead in the place where they had seen him be laid. But Jesus was not there. He is raised. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And yet, they were still terrified. Amazed, yes, but also terrified. Both are a part of God's story. You know, the Greek words that are translated here as terror and amazement are actually much more weighty. The Greek says that the women were seized with tromos and ectasis. These are the root words for trauma and ecstasy. In the face of the greatest news that first Easter morning, Mark says that these women were seized with traumatic ecstasy. That's the life lived in the light of resurrection. Traumatic ecstasy. It's the story that says, through the hardest parts of this life, there is hope beyond all hope. There's joy beyond all joy. There is love beyond all love. 
I've talked about this a few times before, but one of my core memories growing up was when was the summer when my hometown flooded. There were actually two floods when I was growing up, but the one that I remember the most is the one that took place in 2013. One summer night, heavy rains caused the creek in the middle of the town to break its banks, and it sent water rushing right down Main Street. It was tragic. It was traumatic to see my friends in the special places of my life devastated. I look back and I realize that we were seized with tromos. After the water receded, the community faced its who will roll away the stone moment. Who will pump the water out of the basement? Who will help me rebuild my house? Who will reopen the business? And if I'm honest with you, in our heart of hearts, we all kind of felt like that was it. That was the end of the story. The community would never recover. And then the vans started rolling in. Volunteers from the next town over, students from the rival high school, work release inmates from the county correctional facility, all with shovels in hand and boots on feet. One group was from a place that many of you are actually familiar with, Camp Fowler, the same camp that we send our youth to in the summertime. They brought down a group of staff and camper volunteers to help dig out the basements and sort the recycling and whatnot. And you see, the great thing about Camp Fowler people is that where they go, they take their camp spirit with them. When the work was all done in the morning and it was time for lunch, the camp staff led a group of volunteers for the day singing silly songs about moose drinking juice and three little ducks and peanut butter and jelly. And for a moment, as this camp staff member was standing on a folding chair covered in mud, leading these dirt and sweat covered people who had just spent hours doing some of the dirtiest jobs imaginable, for a moment, amidst the pain and the heartbreak of a community reeling from disaster, for a moment amidst the tromos, the trauma, there was ectasis, ecstasy, a glimpse of the resurrection. At that moment, we were all able to realize that God's story for this little upstate New York community did not end with watery destruction, that there would be resurrection. That's God's story for us. This is a life where God is the author. Yes, there is difficulty, but there's also triumph. There's conflict, but there's also reconciliation. There's antagonism, but also there's redemption. There is tension, but also satisfaction. There are plot twists and joyful moments. It's all a part of God's story. There is pain, but there is relief. There is death but there is resurrection because we don't write the story. God does. We will never be capable of writing as good of an ending to the story as God, and that's because we haven't seen God's ending to the story yet. We've heard the end of Mark's gospel, but this is not the end of God's story for us. Remember what the women heard when they entered the tomb. You are looking for Jesus. He is not here. He is going ahead of you. Friends, the tomb was unsealed. Jesus walked out. The story goes on. Christ is risen. This is not the conclusion. This is the end of the first act. We are living God's story for us every moment of every day. We are living in the tromos and the ectasis, the heartbreak and the healing. We are living the story of resurrection, the story of life, of freedom, of eternal love from God. The tomb is unsealed. Christ is risen. The story goes on. And the good news for each and every one of us is that God's love for us is so great that God would go so far as to write us into this unfolding narrative that we call life. Even in the pain and the heartache, especially in the joy and the ecstasy, God is the author of this life. The same God who rolls away the stone and brings life where there was death. We get to live this story of resurrection. We get to be part of God's triumphal act. So my friends, Go from here and live your part of the story. 
Do the things that make a difference in the world. It doesn't have to be dramatic. Just live the story of resurrection in the everyday things. That person at your work who frustrates you and you can't remember why they do, what would it look like if you offered grace to them tomorrow? Try beginning the work of forgiveness to that former friend who you wrote off years ago. Perform the act of mercy at the local food pantry or homeless shelter in the community. Advocate for the voiceless and seek justice for the oppressed by using your voice to speak for them. Share the stories of great joy with your friends and with your family, with your colleagues and with your peers. Love fiercely, whether it's your spouse or your sibling or your friend, especially your neighbor and the stranger. Choose to act with love before all else. Live the story of resurrection. Play your part in the great narrative of life. My friends, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia and amen. And in response, let us lift up our hearts in prayer. Oh, dear God, thank you. Thank you for writing the story. The story of how you gave us your son who was crucified, dead, and buried, yet in profound presence, in power and in peace, he has been raised from the dead. And so thank you for writing us into your story, that because Jesus lives, we shall live also. What amazing love is this, that you would care and sustain and bless us, that death is finished, that love lives, alleluia, Christ is alive. Alleluia. And so awaken us into this story, the story of expectation of victory for our own lives. If or when we are beaten down or challenged by persistent or pursuing sin, give us hope. For you are the God of victory. Help us to rise triumphant over our self-centeredness, small-mindedness, our sins. And thus also give victory over the trials and traumas of this world. Though victory is assured, we yet deal with disease and doubt and depression, downsizing, discouragement, dementia, and yes, death. <clears throat> oh God, you know those with aching hearts for whom this Easter is clouded. Be their strength and stay. We pray especially for the family of our dear Debbie Jensen. Debbie, who is now in heaven, celebrating fully the good news that she so faithfully proclaimed in word and deed. And be with all the peoples of this world that you have loved so much that you gave us your son. We pray for help, for hope, for healing. May that happen physically, but also economically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Too many have been facing discrimination or made to feel less than because of their racial heritage or their sexuality. Oh, bring to the forefront an awareness that none ought to face fear or be marginalized because of who they are, for we are all your children. And thus, O oh God, grant wisdom and safekeeping to those who are laboring for peace, for those in our military, for those who tend the sick and combat disease. We pray for all who are engaged in the relief of the oppressed and the destitute. And we bring to you, O oh Lord of victory, the needs of those who are lonely and lost, those who are in bodily pain, mental anguish, those in sorrow of heart and home, those whose minds are bewildered and perplexed, Open doors of blessing for those needing organ transplants, those seeking employment, those imprisoned by addiction, those hemmed in by heartache. O oh God of trauma, but also of the ecstasy that comes through hope in you, abide with us. 
so that we might then anticipate all the more the day when all will be joy and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, in whose name we boldly pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As our sanctuary choir comes forward, I would invite you, if you are able and as you desire, to stand as well, so that together we might join in that great tradition of being able to stand before our great God and King as the chorus, Hallelujah, is sung and proclaimed in victory and in truth.
my friends, when you go from here, Easter does not end. When you are finished with your dinner, with your families, Easter has not finished yet. When you wake tomorrow morning, Christ is still risen. When you wake the morning after that, Christ is still risen. He is risen now. He is risen for time immortal. So receive this blessing as you go and continue your Easter. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace through the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the risen Lord be the light by which you walk this day and forevermore. And may God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.